welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In the first part of this series, we took a look at how the Bible viewed human government and what it proposed as an alternative to human government, namely, God's sovereign rule. But just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, we moderns don't really like the idea of some seeming ethereal kingdom, which doesn't grant us power in the way that we think power should be wielded. We want to rain down fire on our enemies, just like the pre-resurrection disciples wanted. And since God won't humor our self-proclaimed godly desire for the destruction of our enemies, we vote pro-war and rain down our own justice in the form of bombs. Over the last four episodes, we looked at some of the most Christian iterations of government in history. We saw how each of those iterations marred the name of Christ, at the same time that they thought they were doing great things for him. But that's consequentialism for you, the ever-pervasive sin we can't get away from, and keep on talking about in this podcast. When we don't like God's means, we think we can do better than him by determining good and evil for ourselves. We can help him out since he obviously doesn't know the best way to do things, like we do, of course. That's what we saw with the shift from the anti-Nicene church to Christendom. Whereas the early church viewed sacrifice and integrity as power, and the blood of the martyrs as the seeds of the church, the post-Constantinian church viewed government and sword as power, and therefore had to justify all sorts of wickedness to maintain and wield that power. The blood of the enemies became the seeds of the church. When Christians do as the Gentiles do and lord power over others, which is what the government inherently does in its monopolization of violence and its force of law, Christlikeness takes a back seat to pragmatism, power, and comfort. Now that we have a background for the biblical view of government, as well as a few good case studies under our belt, we're going to dissect the logical ends of Christian involvement in government. This is a very important step because so long as we leave our case studies as simple stories of what other groups did without exploring the formula for how they got there, we'll just write them off as misguided. So in this episode, I want to do two things. First, I want to explore the inner workings of where Christian involvement with government ought to lead, and eventually does, usually. And second, I want to ask some probing questions about consistent application a reductio ad absurdum of sorts, where we are going to look at what following out Christian government looks like, logically. All right, so the the first thing that I don't understand about modern Christian involvement in government is how we explain away not pursuing Old Testament civic law. Conservative Christians are abhorred by Muslims in places where they want to institute Sharia law and act as if mingling religion and politics is, is just absurd. How could those Muslims want to implement Sharia law? Like, there's separation of church and state, of course. But at the same time, we bemoan a society where moral relativism seems to prevail because we know that the Bible teaches us that morality is objective and grounded in God. Even beyond morality being objective, it's, it's also been revealed to a large extent in the Bible, and God and the Bible are immutable. So while the Bible doesn't show us every single evil that exists, it gives us some pretty good guidelines. In fact, as far as it relates to civil law, the Bible also supposedly shows us how God structured a society that he established along with punishments he deemed good and appropriate for particular crimes. Of course, many Christians believe that the sacrificial and purity laws have been set aside since Jesus accomplished those things, but the moral law remains, a law which encompasses many of the civil laws found in the Old Testament, covering moral issues like adultery, disobedience to parents, and other Ten Commandment types of things. So if Christians ought to pursue government, Christians believe that morality is objective, and God shows us how he handles certain moral issues in the civic realm, why don't we Christians pursue establishing a government like the post-Constantine or like the original Westminster Confession set up? I mean, the, the Constitution should not get in the way of Christians pursuing such a thing because God's law is higher than man's law. 
Now, there are a few groups who do recognize this logical conclusion and embrace it, but those groups are very few and not all that vocal a lot of times. In essence, it's not post-Constantinians, crusaders, magisterial reformers, or Muslims seeking to impose Sharia law who are crazy. It's the vast majority of Christians being inconsistent who don't make any sense. So what's the disconnect? I think people want to double dip with Jesus. See, they, they like his idea of writing in the sand when it comes to adultery, rather than the pharisaical version of throwing stones. And we like a less violent Jesus, right? We just don't want a completely nonviolent one. We want mercy and leeway for those sins which we might fall into ourselves or which don't immediately harm us, but we still want the ability to control the sins that we don't like and to kill the enemies that we identify outside of our borders. We don't want the Old Testament as it was revealed to us, but neither do we want Jesus as he revealed the Father to us. We Americans like our smorgasbords, and Jesus is just another menu item. The second thing I don't understand about the modern Christian pursuit of government is how we choose our hierarchy of morals. If we're not going to go with God's full spectrum of moral laws or the civil government that he revealed to us in the Old Testament, then how is it that we end up choosing which things to pursue for God? Because if you look at the conservative Christian right, I mean, we know pretty well exactly what God would pursue. In the United States, we have deemed stopping abortion, preventing gay marriage, and trying to mandate prayer in schools, keeping church tax exemptions, and keeping religious monuments up in public spaces. Uh, These are kind of the things that are dearest to God's heart, I guess. I mean, if one does believe that abortion kills an invaluable human being, as I do, I, I get that one. I see why that's top tier. But why is gay marriage on that list? Isn't adultery and divorce a far greater issue for Christians and society in terms of of numbers and overall impact? Isn't funding of terrorist states like Saudi Arabia, you know, the the place where Osama bin Laden and 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers hailed from, or the country responsible for starving 100,000 Yemeni children, isn't funding them and supporting them militarily a top-tier issue? If I were a Christian pursuing government, I'll tell you how I'd decide what's important. I'd look at the Bible and I'd see what really pissed God off the most. When is God portrayed as being so mad that he either allows really bad things to happen to people or he's depicted as harming them? Now, Ezekiel shows us that the sin of Sodom, you know, the city which God destroyed with fire and brimstone, he depicts their sin as being overfed and unconcerned with the poor. When Israel was sent into exile, while, while idolatry was a significant issue, so also was the oppression of the poor and the vulnerable. That was as big of, if not a bigger issue. And what about the New Testament? We see two instances in the New Testament that I know of, that I can think of at the moment, where God is linked with a New Testament believer's death. One of those is when Ananias and Sapphira lie about their generosity in donating to the church, presumably donations to help those in need because, you know, that's what the church used the donations for. The other time that death is depicted as a result of sin is the famous communion passage. While most people view the communion warning as something which uh, drives them to sift out every sin in their lives before taking communion— the deaths that we see as a result of partaking in communion unworthily actually stem from a very particular sin, the rich eating and partying at the table while the poor had nothing to eat. So people actually died from that. It says some have fallen asleep because of doing that, that very particular thing. The Bible is filled with God's concern for the poor and vulnerable and his displeasure and judgment upon those who take advantage of these groups or who refuse to help. Yet, the poor and vulnerable in our own land, not to mention the poor and vulnerable we exploit through industry and war across the globe, are not top-tier legislation issues for conservative Christians. Why is that? 
like, why are many Christians more concerned about monuments and marriage than about the poor and vulnerable? And I, I think we've kind of answered this a number of times in, in the past few episodes, and I think that answer is sacralism. When you see a man and woman walking down the street, you can't tell if they're engaged in an affair or having premarital sex. But if you see two guys holding hands, that breaks the illusion that we're in a homogenous Christian society. Christians in a sacral society have to defend the appearance of homogeneity because their religion is a house of cards. It's largely surface. It's appearance. Monuments, in God we trust on currency, fealty oaths to God and country every day in school, all of these things are shallow actions, but actions which bind us all together. Whether Christians know it or not, It's not Christianity that a lot of them really care about losing because a relationship with Jesus can't be lost. What it is they really care about losing is the glue of society which makes their lives comfortable and gives them power in a society. The things which prevent them from bearing cross, I guess? You know, when we have a sacral Christian society, even if most people are only cultural Christians— Politicians can't be open about being an atheist or gay because they risk losing votes. Sacralism forces everyone else to play the game, and Christians love the game so long as it's on our terms. But when the tide shifts, the house of card crumbles, uh, and it drives those who benefit from sacralism crazy. We, We hate it. So why do conservative Christians legislate marriage and monuments but despise politicians who are doves and seek to help the poor. Because the former are sacral acts, and the latter aren't. The former garner power for our group, while the latter cost us. And of course, our group hates it when the other group ends up trying to manipulate and control language, when really that's the game we're playing anyway. Alright, so... A Christian government, followed to its logical end, would essentially be a theocracy where we cared about all objective morality, especially the morality as laid out by God in the Bible, the the, the parts that didn't pass away, like the, the sacrificial laws. And it would also look like a society where we cared about issues like poverty and justice, because God talks a lot about those things. And... This society would also care about group cohesion or maintaining its sacralism. If, uh, if the government's role is to punish evil and promote good, then you can't really get much more evil than denying God or more good than worshiping God. So previous Christian societies essentially required that everyone adhere to their religion, which we kind of think is is barbaric, you know, when we talk about the Crusades or... Uh, post-Constantinian um, nations, Rome, whatever, or the magisterial reform were kind of like, man, they're they're kind of barbaric. Um, but it, it really makes sense that they did what they did because the religion and the law are essentially intertwined. I mean, you, you can't really have it any other way because the religion informs the law and the law promotes what is good and punishes what is evil, which is informed by religion. But of course, we we can recognize that we don't like that. There seems to be a problem when religion takes over government and legislation because then they, then they become intertwined. And Verdun in his book, The Reformers and Their Stepchildren, identifies why this is, is a really big deal because there's an implication. If we, if we take these first two, um, two issues that we've identified and we say, okay, well, sacralism kind of makes sense following uh, that understanding, then what implication does sacralism have for society? And here we're doing, uh, quote, Needless to say, sacralists will be embarrassed at this point. They have no receptacle into which they can put a person who can no longer be carried on the church's roles. If he is to be put out of the church, he will also and simultaneously have to be put out of society, that is, exterminated that is, put outside the boundaries. 
If the ecclesiastical community and the societal community are one and the same thing, merely seen from different vantage points, then he who is expelled from the former cannot be allowed to remain in the latter. End quote. A society controlled by those whose religious beliefs actually inform their legislation seems to necessitate sacralism, and sacralism requires the harshest of defenses. If someone commits debauchery, their sin was one of lust and weakness. We can kind of deal with that. But if someone goes against the sacralist formula, this is willful treason and rebellion. For such things, one is excommunicated from the church. But if the church and state are intertwined, to be excommunicated from the church means to be excommunicated from the state, either through exile from the land or from life. In regard to sacralism, I think Stanley Hauerwas hits on some of this concept also in, in one of my favorite articles from him. It's entitled The End of American Protestantism. You should definitely read the whole thing, You'll probably have to read it like twice or at least slow in some parts, um, but it's, it's such a good article. But in this article, Harawas identifies how the United States came to be formed, how Christian, Christianity became American, and um, the, the problems that sacralism of sorts has created. So Harawas says, quote, Protestantism came to the land we now call America to make America Protestant. It was assumed that what it meant to be American and Protestant was equivalent to a faith in the reasonableness of the common man and the establishment of a democratic republic. But in the process, the church in America became American, or, as Mark Knoll puts it, because the churches had done so much to make America, they could not escape living with what they had made. As a result, Americans continued to maintain a stubborn belief in a God but the God they believe in turns out to be the American God. To know or worship that God does not require that a church exist because that God is known through the providential establishment of a free people. This is a presumption shared by the religious right as well as the religious left in America. Both assume that America is the church. End quote. So while the United States has a separation of church and state on the books, Harawas argues that the two have really been conflated. America is our church. And that seems clear when you realize that in many conservative churches, to attack the Republican Party, to stand for racial reconciliation, to not be a war hawk, or to kneel for the national anthem is akin to blasphemy. And I, I don't at all mean that hyperbolically, as I've recounted a number of times throughout um, the, this podcast how we've had run-ins with individuals and churches who have had problems with us being vocal against President Trump when he was president or being for racial reconciliation. Um, we've been threatened uh, to... Uh, we've had our support threatened by certain places. Harawas goes on a little bit more to describe how some of this sacralism plays out. He says, quote, the story that you should have no story, except the story you choose when you had no story, obviously has implications for how faith is understood. The story that you should have no story, except the story you choose when you had no story, produces people who say things like, I believe Jesus is Lord, but that's just my personal opinion. The grammar of this kind of a vowel obviously reveals a superficial person. But such people are the kind many think crucial to sustain democracy, for such a people are necessary in order to avoid the conflicts that otherwise might undermine the order, which is confused with peace, necessary to sustain a society that shares no goods in common other than the belief that there are no goods in common. So an allegedly democratic society that styles itself as one made up of people of strong conviction, in fact becomes the most conformist of social orders, because of the necessity to avoid conflicts that cannot be resolved. End quote. So to wrap this all up, a lot of the vitriol that we're seeing politically in the States is, in my opinion, a result of our sacralism coming to a head. As Harawas just said, you know, a lot of people think that, I mean, essentially, 
you kind of need to not have conflict. You need this pluralism, this um, this uh, kind of everybody being on the same page, which is what sacralism does. You kind of need that in order to to just kind of move along without much issue, without much tension and turmoil internally. But the sacralism is is coming to an, a, a head. Um, you know that old sacralism of monuments and slogans. Um, it it really isn't going away, even though we see the monuments toppling and the slogans being attacked, and um, you know new people coming out on currency. Um, sacralism isn't going away. It's it's really just changing. See, uh, American Christianity taught our society about sacralism and how powerful it is, and we're still clinging on to it. But now another side is seeking to to hijack and take that. Whether it's erecting new monuments or sacralizing language to punish those who don't say things the right way or who don't say the right things or show the right emotions at the, at the um, you know, appropriate times for the appropriate reasons or whatever else, we're not getting rid of sacralism. It's, it's just that the new group is taking over. This shifting of power is what has so many Christians up in arms, whether they know it or not. Because most Christians don't think that they're they're up in arms because power shifting. They're up in arms for morality, right? At least the morality that they identify. When when we were killing hundreds of thousands of Native Americans, uh, or millions of them, uh, and enslaving millions of Africans, I don't know that I could say that our society was really better off than morally, right? But they sure did look more Christian, didn't they? Judging by at least their language or whether or not they went to church on Sunday. Modern conservatives convince themselves that the United States today is worse because they're judging it by the sins that they cherry pick, not by the sins or the civil laws that God laid out in the Bible, and not by the sins that we know God really hates, like injustice and oppression. But really... Christians, conservative Christians, are, are upset at losing appearances, losing power. We're upset that sacralism is going away, or at least that it's, it's shifting hands. You know, I, I do thank God that American sacralism is falling away, because I see how such a thing played out at various times in history. I'm so, so grateful that American Christian sacralism um, has, has not taken hold as it did elsewhere, that American Christian sacralists have been inconsistent in their application of religion and government. I'm, I'm so thankful for that, because our history could have been much bloodier and nastier than it already is. Now, if you're a Christian who believes in objective morality, and that we should participate in government, I think you have quite a lot to work through here. How do you pick and choose which evils you punish and how severely you punish those evils? Because I can pretty much guarantee you, you're not picking and choosing the evils that God has picked, and you are not, um, you are not punishing them in the ways that God has shown us he likes them to be punished according to his, his civil laws. How do you justify not pursuing a theocracy of sorts? What insight do you have that the greatest pro-government Christian minds didn't have? Men like Augustine, Aquinas, and Calvin, all of whom took laws and their punishments to many of the logical ends that we discuss today. I can point to a tradition, the anti-Nicene tradition, and explain how I arrive at the conclusion of no king but Christ. But how do you throw off 1,800 years of church history and their handling of government over those 1,800 years? Actually, 1,500 years if we take out the anti-Nicene church. Um, how do you think that, that we're more enlightened in the last 200 years than they were in the 1,500 preceding that? There's so much to deal with here, and, and I don't see how Christians justify splitting the middle on this one. It seems like Calvin and um, Augustine and those other guys they're right, or the anti-Nicene church is right about um, our inability to participate in government. I don't see how you split the middle on this one. But hey, you know what? 
I'm not going to burn you at the stake for disagreeing with me if you end up disagreeing with me. Even if I know that one day you may very well try to burn me, should you ever gain the power and the chance. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.